Capital structure is how companies finance their operations. The two predominant ways this happens is by taking on debt and issuing equity. In Module 3, we'll focus on equity, which is also known as stock. This is an image of a stock certificate. Here, this is the Walt Disney Company stock certificate. You'll notice this has a few features. It lists common stock, which is a type of stock. We'll learn that it could also be preferred stock. It has something called a par value, in this case, one cent. It also names the person it's issued to, the record holder. It's signed by the secretary and the chairman of the board. And it includes the stock certificate number, the company seal, and the number of shares the stock certificate represents. There are a few core concepts to know about stock at the outset of our discussion. The first is that under corporations there is a separation between ownership and control. Stock represents ownership of a corporation. If you add up all the stock of a corporation, all those stockholders combined are the sole owners of that corporation. A corporation is owned by its stockholders in the entirety, but they don't get to control it, at least not directly. A corporation is controlled by a board of directors acting together. The stockholders have the power to vote for the board of directors, but the board of directors then are able to run the day-to-day -day operations of the company and make all of its decisions. However, the board is usually too busy to make all these decisions, so they'll delegate authority to various corporate officers. For example, the CEO, or chief executive officer, is usually the highest ranking officer or manager of a company. But he doesn't own the company, not unless he's a shareholder, nor do the board of directors or the board members individually, again, unless they're shareholders. By the way, shareholder and stockholder have exactly the same meaning. Directors who own stock are called, in that company, are called inside directors, and directors who do not own stock in the company are called outside directors. So what is your stock worth? Well, that depends on two things. It depends on what the company is worth in its entirety, which is a subject called valuation that we covered in Module 1. And it depends on what percentage of the company you own. It doesn't matter if you have 1 out of 100 shares, 10 out of 1,000 shares, or 100 out of 10,000 shares. All of those reflect a 1% ownership in a company, and all of them have the same economic value. The only thing that matters in stock is not the number of shares, but the percentage of the company that that number represents. Stock is subordinate to debt. This means that in a merger or acquisition, or a bankruptcy, or any other time the company is liquidated, the debt holders are paid first. This is important to note because stockholders have what's called a residual claim, but they do not get first rights to the company's money, or the value of the company, if there are debtors who are superior to them. We learned about the double accounting method and the fundamental equation in our previous module. The fundamental equation is that assets equal liabilities plus, plus equities. Liabilities are things like debts, and equities reflect stock. So when you sell stock, you make two entries in our double entry accounting method. We add to the equity side of the table. And we, and we also, also add, add, add to the asset, the asset side, side of the table. Because, because when, when we sell stocks, stocks we receive an asset, asset. Cash. cash. There's some basic it's terminology it's about stock. stock. One it's is to call stock authorized. Authorized means the number of shares the company is allowed to sell. Only the board of directors can authorize stock. And they do so by having a meeting or by having a unanimous written consent when all the directors agree in writing to do so. And then they have to amend and restate the charter or certificate of incorporation, also known as the articles of incorporation, stating the number of authorized shares. 
This is a document which is filed with the Secretary of State where the company is incorporated. The company can never issue more than its number of authorized shares. Issued means that the stock has been sold or transferred to a stockholder. Once a stock is issued, it remains issued forever, even if that stock is later returned to the company. Stock that remains in the hands of stockholders is called outstanding shares, and this is the number that matters most when determining the percentage interest in a company. We don't care really about authorized shares when determining our percentage interest because only outstanding shares reflect who is the owner of the company. Let's say there are 1,000 authorized shares, 100 outstanding shares, and you have one share. What percent interest do you have? You have a 1% interest, but it's possible that that could drop to a 0.1% interest if the company issues the remainder of its authorized shares. A company can also get rid of some of its outstanding shares by repurchasing them. It can go to its stockholders and say, I will pay you for that stock, at which point it becomes treasury shares when owned by the company. Treasury shares can't vote, and they don't count toward the percent of the company that we talked about a moment ago with regard to outstanding shares. But a stock is issued forever once it's issued. So even stock that has been repurchased by the company is still issued, but it's not outstanding. Again, the outstanding shares are the ones that vote and reflect the percent ownership in the company because treasury shares don't vote and don't factor in to the percent that is outstanding. There are two main types of stock. The first is common stock, which as you can imagine is the more common stock. This has the residual claim on the company's assets after it has been liquidated in a merger, bankruptcy, or otherwise. Common stock gets paid last. Remember that debt gets paid first, and other stockholders, preferred stockholders, which we'll look at in a moment, get paid next. Common stock gets what's left over. But usually, in most companies, in return for this, they have more voting rights. Common stock almost always has the right to vote on the board of directors. And in this way, they have the right to protect themselves. They may also be able to vote on fundamental transactions, such as a merger, which could affect them. If a merger is sold, sells a company at too low a value for them to be paid out, the common stockholders may not approve the merger. Preferred stockholders have a senior claim, at least with regard to stockholders. They're still junior to debt holders or lenders, but they have a few preferences one is the dividend preference. A dividend is a payment made to stockholders either on a special or a regular basis. Sometimes preferred stockholders have the right to receive dividends at regular intervals. This may sound like how debt holders have the right to receive an interest and or principal payment at regular intervals, but there's a critical difference between dividends and debt payments. If dividends are not paid, the preferred stockholders have no right to bring the company to bankruptcy court. There are two kinds of dividends, cumulative and non-cumulative. If a non-cumulative dividend is not paid, it simply goes away. If a cumulative dividend is not paid, it adds up and becomes owed, at which point the company will have to pay it before it's able to pay other stockholders that are junior to the preferred stockholder. Preferred stockholders may also have a liquidation preference. This means that they're paid first in a liquidation and they may receive a liquidation multiple. For example, if a preferred stockholder invests $1,000 and has a 2x liquidation preference, that means that before the common stockholder is paid, the preferred stockholder will be paid $2,000 in the event of a liquidation. The common stockholder is paid whatever is left over, if there's anything. But stockholders typically don't try to make their money hoping for a liquidation of the company. Usually they are able to make money by the stock value increasing and then reselling the stock. The sale and resale of stock is governed by something called securities regulations. And the U.S. entity that governs our securities regulations is the Securities and Exchange Commission. The core securities regulations on a federal level are the Securities Act of 1933, 
the Securities Exchange Act of 1934, the Investment Company Act of 1940, and the Investment Advisors Act of 1940. These four laws form the core of our securities regulations, although others have passed in more recent times. And some laws have some impact on our securities regulations, even though it's not their primary impact, like the Dodd-Frank bill. Securities regulations govern companies in two different ways. They govern private companies according to Regulation D. Regulation D allows companies to sell stock with very few additional regulations if the stock is sold primarily to accredited investors. Accredited investors are high wealth individuals. Currently that's defined as individuals with more than a million dollars in net wealth, not including their primary residence, who earn over $200,000 a year singly or $300,000 a year with their spouse. Public companies are different. They've gone through a process called an initial public offering, and they're subject to various reporting requirements under the federal laws. But they're able to sell stock to anybody who participates in the stock market. Any company that you see listed with the stock symbol on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ is a public company and they have to make reporting requirements such as 10 Qs, 10 Ks, and 8 Ks, which are annual, quarterly, and special reports. These reports can be very expensive to make. Some estimates say being public cost $5 million in the first instance to go public and over a million dollars a year to stay public. It's very expensive to comply with all the regulations, and so why do companies do it? It gives them access to more investors and allows them to sell stock more easily to more people. So there's a trade-off between being public and being private. To conclude, let's talk about some of the legal rights shareholders may have or demand. This depends a bit on what type of investor we're talking about. Some of the main categories are angel investors, who are private individuals that invest their own money usually in private companies that are just getting started. Then there are venture capital investors who manage funds of other people's money and they invest in companies that are generally privately held because they're accredited investors that are allowed to invest in these companies, although they typically invest in companies that are a little more mature or later stage or older than those that angels invest in. And then we have the rank and file retail investors which are the ordinary people that are not necessarily accredited and purchase stock on markets like the New York Stock Exchange and the NASDAQ. Stockholders have statutory rights. The federal law that we discussed minutes ago provides a number of disclosure obligations that give stockholders the right to know things about the company. The main contribution of the securities regulations are disclosures. They're predicated on the idea that sunlight is the best disinfectant, in the words of Judge Louis Brandeis. State security laws, state corporate laws rather, such as the laws of the state of Delaware, govern the internal affairs of a corporation and talk about how it manages its business and relates to its stockholders. This is often what we talk about when we talk about corporate governance. It provides for when shareholders have the right to vote and it also provides for their rights to sue the directors or the company. Stockholders can also discipline management by selling their shares, but this can be limited based on whether or not the company is public or private. There's not always a market for shares, so it can be hard to discipline management by reselling shares. Stockholders can also have rights that they get contractually. One right stockholders may obtain by contract is to have a seat on the board. Sometimes this happens when an activist investor, which is a person who gets other investors to vote against management, settles with management in return for some representation on the board. Preferred stockholders may also bargain for board representation in, in return for making a large investment in a private company. Preferred stockholders may also have something called protective provisions, which gives them the right to veto certain transactions they don't approve of. For example, a preferred stockholder may have the right to vote on any issuance of debt of more than a million dollars, or the issuance of any securities that are senior to them. These protective provisions are very important in venture capital transactions and are often found in the shareholders' rights agreement. I'm glad you joined me to discuss equity securities. 
Next module, we'll discuss convertible debt, which is a hybrid of the equity and debt instruments we just spoke about. I'm Professor Seth C. Orenberg. Thanks.